Welcome to the news review segment on the AM show. I can just, I just caught myself in the camera there and I look like Hajia. <laughs> but just a gentle reminder that this segment is always brought to you by Endpoints Homeopathy Clinic and they're offering free prostate, prostate screening and free fertility screening um, at the various locations. Here in Accra, they are on the Spintex Road opposite the Shell, Shell Sign Board. In Kumasi Kronumabwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex in Takradi Naji Estate. In Tema Community 22, in Techi Manhanswa and Nesiyama in Zima. Their call lines are 244 867 and 274 Endpoints Homeopathic Clinic, the end to chronic disease. This morning, I'll be joined by two gentlemen to get into the various stories captured on the various news portals. We'll start, of course, from myjoyonline.com, and then we'll go to the other portals. The energy experts and, uh, well, let me start by introducing Suleiman Abraima, the executive director for Media Foundation for West Africa. He's joining us on Zoom now. Good morning, Suleiman Abraima. Um, good morning, and thank you for having me. Great. And we also have Kojo Poku, who is... Um, an energy expert and chairman for the Manifesto Committee on Energy for Dr. Mahmoud Balmier's campaign. Kojo Poku, it's good to have you. Good morning. Hi, uh, good morning, sweetie. How are you? I'm fantastic. And Baraka de Sala, Suleiman Abraima. <laughs> Baraka de may Allah's blessings be upon all of us. Amen. Uh, Ami, is that the correct response? Ami, right? <laughs> yes, I mean, both are correct. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. So like we do on the show, you both have a minute or two to get into any topical issue that you have some responses to. I'll start with you, Suleiman Abraima. What's on your mind this morning? Well, of course, I mean, uh, yesterday was a great day for um, those of us who are Muslims and at the same time um, fathers. It was, um, I think, a double bonanza. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't often happen to have two occasions, great occasions on the same day. So uh, let me say, uh, Baraka de Salah to all Muslims um, in Ghana and around West Africa and indeed around the world. And then, of course, to those who are fathers to say um, Happy Father's Day to everyone. And uh, we pray that our country um, goes the way that we want it to go. We pray that our leaders are able to steer the affairs of the country in the, in the best of directions. So that's what I would say. All right. Kojo Poku. Um, I would want to wish all Muslim communities um, Eid Mubarak and also Happy Father's Day to all fathers around the world mm. um, those watching us this morning. Um, my little issue is with you, Sweetie. Um, the last time you hosted a gentleman on your show on from um, Allen, I think political advisor to Allen, you let the gentleman get away with certain untruth which I did a social media write-up, I don't know if you saw it, in regards to the powers of a minister and the powers that be for people I who are in the executive. I saw your comments, Kojo Poku, and it's, your point is duly noted. Thank you. Thank you. So, right. I mean, I, I think in the future we should learn to correct those things when people make those comments. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So let's start from enjoyonline.com because it's a holiday, we don't have the newspapers. Um, on the... On our websites this morning, on our top story, they say Galamse smuggling and bad weather slash cocoa's revenue by $500 million. Let's get into that story first, and then I'll come to you gentlemen for your reactions. The story reads, illegal mining activities and favorable weather conditions and swollen shoots virus um, have caused a significant shortfall in Ghana's cocoa revenue for the first quarter of 2024. Fifi Boafo, head of the public affairs at Cocoa Board, in an interview with Joy News, at, I mean on Joy News Desk, explained the key factors behind the alarming drop of over $500 million in Ghana's cocoa revenue, as reported by the Bank of Ghana. Quote, illegal mining activities are cutting off farmers from their farms, he stated, highlighting the detrimental impact of these illicit activities on cocoa production. He added that farmers find it difficult to get aid to harvest cocoa due to these disruptions. Now, the environmental consequences of illegal mining have also been severe, with polluted water bodies affecting irrigation. Illegal mining activities are polluting water bodies needed to irrigate cocoa farmers. That's what um, Mr. Boafo said. In addition to illegal mining, adverse weather conditions have played a crucial role in the revenue decline, he pointed to the El Nino phenomenon, which caused warmer and drier conditions 
leading to lower yields. Suleiman Abraima, what are your thoughts on our declining yields and revenue generation when it comes to the cocoa sector? I mean, talk about Galamse and you know, the harm it's causing to our water bodies and all that. What's your take? Well, um, it's, it's great to hear my friend uh, Fifi Buafo, um, um, who not long ago was uh, on Oman FM as the morning show host today, um, talk, telling us about um, cocoa production and um, what has happened. Um, of course, we, we've all been following the challenge with illegal mining in our country. We all know about the um, consequences of climate change, and all nations are bearing the brunt of, of climate change. And therefore, one would expect that if these things are happening, um, they would certainly have implications on all sectors of our society, including um, the cocoa sector, as has been said. Mm. But I think that um, the truth is that in our country, perhaps um, President Kufour started it and um, President Mills, President Mohammed's time, we saw some um, effort towards revamping the cocoa sector. Uh, the number of policies. And, and as I said, started with President Kufour's time and then um, invariably right after President Kufour exited, we saw the number of um, uh, tonnage produced by, <clears throat> by cocoa farmers or as a country, the cocoa production shooting up as a result of the policies that had been introduced by President Kufour at the time. And then, of course, as I said, this, you know, uh, moved on to this fertilizer program um, the issue about cocoa rules and all of that. Right. So I, I think at some point farmers were being uh, incentivized. Otherwise, as somebody who grew up in a cocoa village, I understand and I know the dynamics of um, cocoa farming and cocoa production. And the truth is that as a country, we've never prioritized you know, the welfare of the cocoa farm. And so for me, it is not surprising. There was a time I saw um, uh, somebody, ostensibly a farmer, saying that, Throughout my life as a cocoa farmer, I've not been able to even build uh, for myself mm. a one bedroom um, house. And I gave part of my cocoa farm for mining and I've been able to put out um, a, a three bedroom house. The question is, do you blame such a person? When the person has been a cocoa farmer all throughout, um, no benefits, people sitting in Accra, either through cocoa board, either through a minister or whatever, are are profiteering from, mm -hmm. from, the, from the sweat of cocoa farmers. Somebody becomes um, maybe an appointee at the cocoa board, and within two, three years, the person is acquiring properties all over. Um, somebody is just a personal assistant, assistant to mm -hmm. a leader at cocoa board, and the person flies business class, first class, and the cocoa farmer in Sehi or Akontomra or whatever it is, you know, um, struggles to even get to the, the district because the road is not good. So we've never prioritized the cocoa sector, as I said, perhaps yeah. after President Kufour's time and all of that. And so for me, it's not surprising. And again, the issue of illegal mining, I mean, we, we know about it. And I said on news file over the weekend that I don't think that this government, with all the you know, big talk and all of that, really committed to the fight against illegal mining. Mm -hmm. And the evidence is clear. We have people, people in the party, leaders in the party. We have people in government who are involved in mining. And I'm not saying this. Professor Fupo Boateng's report said that. Mm. And, and, and for us, very soon, when we start our series on illegal mining, and you get to know the people behind the illegal mining um, um, processes in our country. You get to know the people who have been the beneficiaries of this whole bizarre thing of giving away forest reserves for mining. You would get to understand whether this government has been truly committed to the fight against illegal mining right. or otherwise. So, I mean, um, that's what I would say to that. It's unfortunate that we are losing, you know, that mm. um, position as one of the leading cocoa producers in the world. And if care is not taken very soon, maybe we'll just be doing um, hundreds rather than, you know, getting to the million tonnage that we've been producing over the years. All right. Um, Kojopoku, I'm not asking a direct question, but just so you can respond to some of the things that Suleimana said about not prioritizing um, cocoa in this administration. What are your thoughts? Well, cocoa is prioritized. I don't think the statement to say that cocoa is not prioritized is, um, is correct. Um, look, you cannot be a government of Ghana and not prioritize cocoa. 
Cocoa is the bedrock of this country. We are the leading producer of cocoa next to Ivory Coast. And if you see what this government has achieved in the last seven years, um, it's phenomenal in terms of getting the price, in having an accord with Ivory Coast to make sure that there is a price parity between what we pay and what the Ivorians pay to stop smuggling. In fact, there has been a lot of collaboration between the two countries. So this government has the utmost prioritized cocoa. Let me correct a few things. Um, I think when my brother said that um, our brother Fifi Boafo was on a host of a show and now talking about cocoa, I'm sure he's aware that Fifi Boafo is the head of public affairs for Cocoa Board. So if he talks about cocoa, he's basically just doing the work that he's been given to educate the public on the issues at Cocoa Board. Um, Let's say this. There has been certain unfortunate incidents in the country, and everybody should speak against it, which is the Kalamse. Unfortunately for Ghana, where the gold is, is where our fertile land is, and that's where the cocoa is, which is near these rivers in the western region, in the western part of the country. Um, we are fighting with greed, with um, honest work. As my brother rightfully put it, somebody has been doing coco, he couldn't put up a house, now he gave his land to Galamse and he's put up a house. It's like you saying that, oh, you had a car, it was a taxi, you couldn't afford much, you gave it to arm robbers and now you built a house. Okay, illegal stuff always pay more. Honest living is difficult, but that's what we always, that's what we all do. Um, when you give your land and all the farmers listening to us who attest to this, when you give your land to the Galamse, that land is gone forever because there is no reclamation. They turn the soil upside down. So that soil is basically not used for the next God knows how many years. So the problem we have as a country is that, yes, people are looking for short term gains. But short term gains, by all means, go and do the illegality. But the long term, you lose because if somebody gives you uh, money to build a house, then what next? After you build a house, you stay in there. What are you going to eat? But you have a cocoa, people's cocoa farm. My family has cocoa farm, and it's basically looked after the generation for three generations, and it's still basically bringing money that we use to keep the house in Kumasi. So I, I don't get this to where people think that short gains is better than longevity. It's a problem, it's a menace, and we all need to speak against Galam City. Would you that say is that, why, yeah. Say okay, again? I was going to ask, but I, you just mentioned it, so you finish your trip. I was going to ask you if you think that this administration is prioritizing the fight against Galamse. I mean, well, that's our number, have, also our number that, one that, thing that's affecting our cocoa sector. So, Well, there has been a lot of fight. Look, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a good, uh, I can't say, in, that says that, oh, pep, what, what, no, 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 it doesn't mean that you are not good at throwing the stone. It's just that the person you are throwing the stone at is also trying to act differently. Look, the government has fought Galamse, but you see, it has come to the conclusion that now, um, instead of fighting it, why don't you now find ways to basically bring them into the mainstream? Look, it's gold, it's money. There's no way you can tell people to stop mining gold. So the thinking going forward is like, instead of, that's why the vice president has been going around the country saying that instead of burning excavators, instead of basically chasing these people and playing hide and seek with them, why don't you bring policies to formalize? And that is the thinking now going forward that, look, there's going to be a mineral development for, um, bank. There's going to be a mineral development bank. There's going to be financing to bring these people with this energy and the technique to do Take them into areas, because now, if you see what they are doing, Galamse is basically, oh, I think there's gold here. Then he starts digging. He has no scientific or he has no data. He's just basically digging in terms of trying to find gold. And he would dig a whole acre and find just one small ounce of gold. The thinking is that, look, government, instead of fighting them, put money into exploration. Initial um, exploration with the geotechnical and the geology department of the country. Let them now map out where the gold is. So we all know there's gold here. We all know the tonnage and the ounces of gold. Then basically give those out to the Ghanaians. So they move away from trying to scout for gold in our rivers and scout for gold in our um, cocoa farms. But it takes a bit of doing, you get it wrong, and it's only the right thing for you to say, look, we fought it. We fought it this way. We've gotten it wrong. Or it has not yielded the right solution that we want. So let's rethink it. And now there's a rethink to basically say that, look, let's empower them. Let's not fight it. 
but bring them in into a formalized sector. I think what Suleimana said was what I actually repeated, that we are not prioritizing the fight against Galamsey. So I think I want you to rate this. It is prioritized. Would you say look, that... I, 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 oh, it's, Kodo, it's, it's, just, just, let me, let, just let me complete my trail of thoughts. No, but you, you are saying, saying it's not prioritized. Of... I'm saying it's prioritized, and you're coming back to the same point again. It is prioritized. The fact that you are not seeing the, you, the results you want doesn't mean it's not prioritized. For you to say that it's not prioritized, it's erroneous. It is prioritized. Right. So I'm asking, on a scale of 1 to 10, would you say this administration, how would you rate the fight against illegal mining for this administration? On a scale of 1 to 10. 10 out of 10. And now, 10 out of 10. Kojopo, have, have you look, seen look, our look, water two, bodies? There, there, have you seen our rivers? Have you watched the documentaries pointing dear, for there gold? There are two conversations. My dear, there are two conversations. Yes, you see, what I'm saying that... You cannot are, rate 10 out of 10 when we are, we are staring no, all these your problems... Fight, my dear, your fight against... Listen, I'm saying there are two conversations. Your fight against corruption can be 10 out of 10. The next question is, has it yielded the right results? That's the different conversation. Mm. So on the, on the part of government, government has prioritized the fight against um, Galamse. Has it yielded the right results? That is the different conversation. So that's what I'm saying, that let's not put down the fight or the zeal or the, the will of the government to fight Galam Say. Don't say that because they have not yielded the right results, government has not fought it. That's what I'm saying, that because 10 out of 10 fight against Galam Say has not yielded the results that the country wants, we need to do a rethink. What are the three actionable steps that... I'm staying on this because I, I'm really... I'm curious to know oh, what you actually you think go ahead, about this. It's a problem. Give me three actionable steps that this government have taken to fight Galamsey. I heard Dr. Baumia say, I think about two months ago, that they will no longer burn excavators for, I mean, when they, when they seize them from these illegal miners. What three things, specifically, has this administration okay, so done you, to you fight you are, you are, Galamsey? You're talking about two different things now. What doctor asking, talks about... No, 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 I'm looking, just making a let, reference let me land, point. Let me, so idea, what three the question, steps let me has this get, administration there, taken to about, fight Galamsey? My dear, pretty, pretty, calm down, let me land. What doctor talks about is the forward-looking approach, which I have explained That's earlier. That's okay. That's not the focus asking, of let, the... Mm. Go ahead. You are asking about three steps mm. taken by this government, okay? From mm. 2017 till now. You have seen the tax, the numerous tax force that has been put up. You have seen the, 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 the communique that went out to all district assemblies that no excavator should move around the, um, the districts without the proud notification or approval by DCEs. You have seen the drones being used by the military to basically fight these galamsays. Those are things that I can mention more. It doesn't mean that, look, how do you fight illegality? Because the point is that, like I said earlier, you are throwing a stone at the bird and the bird is trying to move. So the fight, which is the chase, the, the, the military approach, the, 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 the militancy approach, seven years, and we are still seeing, like you said, All in right. the community. All right, and Pedro, some we, of we have to move that, on. Hold on, <laughs> let, let me learn quickly, let me learn quickly. And some of the things that going forward, the rethink is that let's also involve the chiefs in the fight which is something that has not been done in the past. So there is a rethink of the approach. All right, so you are doing all these it hasn't yielded no, results about, no, yet. No, see, wait, wait, hold words, on, hold on. Words, no, it no, hasn't yielded don't results yet. Yes, yes you're rating yes, this administration done. 10 out of 10. I find it very interesting. But we need to move well, on to other stories. Um, you, find it, you find it interesting because you want to stick to your position that nothing has been achieved. The fact I'm telling you that the fact that the right result has not been achieved does not take away the fact that there has been a zeal to fight it. <laughs> In other stories on MyJoyOnline.com, thank you, Kojo. Lessons from Baumier's leadership, principles and values examined in new book. Now, communications and journalism lecturer, Professor Godwin H. S. Ganku, has highlighted some emerging values and leadership principles embedded in Dr. Mahmoud Baumier's vice presidency in a new book released recently. He stated that beyond politics, the life of vice president Dr. Mahmoud Baumier holds some inspiration for the youth governance, leadership and communications in general. Now, Professor Skanku said this in an interview with Paul Adumotre at the back of his latest book, Dr. Baumia and the Modern Vice Presidency in Ghana. Now, according to him, corporate leadership in terms of what deputies and assistants can learn from his loyalty to the president, his hard work 
and his depend dependability. Drawing some analysis from the book, Professor Skanku believes that Dr. Baumia has lived up to what is expected of a modern Afrocentric vice president. Suleiman Abraima, has the vice president lived up to a modern, what is expected of a modern Afrocentric vice president? Who do you say? Um, well, I would, I would comment on that briefly, but I just want to touch on the um, earlier topic also briefly. Right. And to say to my, my brother, Kojo, that quite often we need to be mindful that it is not just about what we want to say as either politicians or activists. It is not about what we think is right to say. We need to always remind ourselves that whatever we are saying, the people on the ground know more, they feel more, and sometimes they bear the consequences even more than those of us who sit here in Accra. Mm. So in terms of whether or not the government has been committed to the fight against Galamse, I mean, the, the, the truth is with the people on the ground and they know what is happening. They know the involvement of party people. They know the involvement of government people. In some areas, they know about the involvement of, of some DCEs mm. and all of that. Not too long ago, in fact, this is about just last week or the week before, we had a parliamentary candidate telling people that, look, um, this Galam stop and Galam this and so on and so forth, we've banned all of them. You know, if you are at your site and somebody comes and says uh, he's a police officer or a military officer, if you have something you want to give to the person, give it to the person. But if the person wants to seize your this, destroy your that, or hits you, you have to hit him back. If anything, I'll, 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 you call me, I'll come to your defense. This was being said in the presence of the regional minister. Hmm. The point I'm making is that people on the ground know what is happening. And so uh, people would find it quite amazing that someone would say, oh, the government's fight has been 10 over 10. We talked about Coco. Uh, my brother, Mr. Poku, says, government has prioritized it. We're talking about Galamse. Government has prioritized it. I mean, if, if all the things government has prioritized, you know, are failing, then what kind of prioritization is that? We are prioritizing cocoa, yet our cocoa production is going down and down and down. We are prioritizing against the, uh, prioritizing the fight against Galamse, yet our water bodies have all almost been destroyed. Our forest reserves are being given out. People are on the ground digging and all of that. Um, what kind of prioritization is that? 10 right. over 10? Then what would it have been if it was 5 over 5, 5 over 10 or 2 over 10? I just wanted to, to talk about that and to, let, to remind us that all the time, when we are here, yeah, people are listening and the people know what is happening. It's not about what we want to say or what we feel like saying or what we think is right to say. Right. It's about a reflection on the ground. Um, on, on Dr. Baumia's, um, on the book about Dr. Baumia, let me first of all congratulate um, my very good friend, um, H.S. Ikanku, mm. um, for, for putting together a book. I think that it takes a lot of discipline, a lot of commitment, and a lot of hard work to be able to put together um, a book, um, whatever, whatever it is. And it's always good in, in academia for people to put their thoughts together so that those who disagree or those who have different perspectives can also share. That is how we grow knowledge. Mm. And so I think it is commendable that we have a book uh, looking into the uh, leadership of um, Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. Okay. Um, I think the rest will be really uh, political in terms of examining whether, in my view, he's done well or he's not done well. Um, I think the rest will be political, so I don't All want right. to go into that route. All right. Kujopoku, your take on this book that talks about or studies um, the work of the Vice President. Um, I'm, I'm very confused. My brother says that the rest will be political, but he's been making political statements since we started this thing. So how is he, if he comment that the vice president has been the best vice president we've ever had, what is political about it? <laughs> I, I, I'm confused. What is political about that? Comment the man. The man has done well. Comment him. No, you, no, you've said, no, you, know, you condemn the government. You condemn the government. You've said all sorts of things. Why commending the vice president political? You can't comment a good thing. Oh, you know, if you want me to get yes, there, I'll come in. Yeah, the man no, has no, been no. the book you say that hold on. You, you want us to get there, I'll write out the book. Let me land. Please, let me land. Let, let me land. You commended the writer of the book. You commended the good work he has done. But the good work that the man he wrote about has done, if you comment on that, is political. 
I didn't say that I so, okay, so Kojo, do you want, do you want him to respond well to well. Kojo, okay. do you want I mean, him to if you want him to respond, allow him to do that. Okay. Suleiman, no, I think but he my wants point you is that I, I'm confused. But anyway, let me move on. Let me no, move no, on. I'm, that, I'm, I'm really surprised he said that because if somebody has done well, you can say he's done well. What is practical so, so, about that? So um, if, 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 if there's time and you want me to do that, I'm really happy In fact, Suleiman, I'll, well, I'll give you about a minute. I'll give you a minute to, to respond you because to say it's political. Kojo Boku obviously wants you to get into it. I'll, I'll allow it. I'll give you a minute to get into it. And I'll come, I'll circle back to you, Kojo. So Suleiman, please get into what you want to say that, you know, might sound political, but I think Kojo wants to hear it. Now I'm curious. But he has already made political statements. So, what so is Kojo, political just hold your horses. Let him, let, him, let him respond and then we come back to you. Suleiman, your take. Well, you see, uh, first of all, to clarify what I meant by political, I, my point is that it would it'd be getting me into assessing or giving my personal view about the performance of the vice president. And, and that, that's an area that I didn't want to go to. Because first of all, I haven't read the book. But, mm. but if I'm to comment outside of the book, um, yes, the vice president, people have talked about his loyalty. But for me, it's about the results that we've seen. We, I, I don't think that any objective person will say that today in the country that we live in, things are going the way they should go. Whether you're looking at the economy, whether you're looking at people's living condition, cost of living and all of that, I don't think that we are where we are. People say that we shouldn't blame the, the vice president because as he says, he was not the one holding the steer. He was not the driver of the car. Mm. But if you are a deputy to um, the driver of the car, the mate, and then the car you know, runs into a ditch, then you want, you want us to completely exonerate you? Maybe, well, that's, that's really questionable. All right. Of course, the vice president we all knew was an, uh, or is an economist, and there's no doubt about that. And he is the, 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 the chairman of the economic management team. He himself, you know, at some point came out um, talked about how strong the economic management team was and the fact that in the previous regime, no one could even remember who were the members of the economic management team. Today, I don't think that Kojo would tell us that the economy is doing well. They talk, we'll talk about Russia, Ukraine, and all of that. But I will reference back to Baumia to say, ah, how did all this escape Cote d'Ivoire, escape Togo, escape this, and only came to land uh, here in Ghana? Mm -hmm. I think that, yes, globally, there are economic issues, but I mean, I travel around. Okay. Um, I work around West Africa. I know the situation of some of the West African countries. I don't think that the currencies in all these countries are doing as badly as, you know, um, our, our Ghana city is doing. Okay. Um, of course, we talk about digitalization and the fact that, you know, um, we've made some progress. Yes, that is, that is um, considerable progress. I was in South Africa last, last month for the ID conference and <laughs> I actually tweeted, if you follow me, you see on my tweet, that I was amazed at the progress that every country is making. And uh, nearly every African country was there, Liberia, Sierra Leone, even the countries that we would say we are ahead of them when it comes to development. Okay. And in terms of digitalization, every country is making progress. It's, the future is digital and digital is the future. And so, yes, we're doing digitalization, but if you look at the context, it's not something that is so surprising or so extraordinary. And All so, right. yes, mm -hmm. I, 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 I hesitate to go into analyzing um, because he's a candidate. So if we get to that, I'll be happy to do that. But this is a book. I have not reviewed the book. I've not read the book. And that's why I didn't want to get into All the, right. the point of analyzing. My brother, let's right. move Points on. You've already done that. You but, see, let's move on. You've already done that. So anyway, let's not go into the, Your personal view is what I wanted. And you've expressed your personal view, which is a good thing. All right, Kojo, you're, anyway, you're taken. Let me get into let me, You've expressed your personal view. That's a good thing. Let's move Absolutely. on. Look, two, 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 two points I want to make before I get to the, the, the beautiful doctor's uh, success story. Look, the, the point about... Let me reiterate this point. An action and results are two different things. You might debate the results, but you cannot debate the action. The government has put in a lot of effort, prioritized the fight against Galamse and making sure our cocoa thrives. That action, nobody can fault the action. Has it, re has it gotten the right results? That is where the conversation is. My brother mentioned that somebody has given away their cocoon farm for Galamse and built a three-bedroom house. 
the people on the ground who know why and what it is are the results of what we are today because they are part of the problem. But the government is still committed to the fight. Kojo, we Whether don't have we enough have time. The, let so me, let me, I, my, my dear, it's my time. So please let me go ahead with it. Please, sorry. Let me, allow me. Now, on the book of the vice president, the vice president is the only vice president that can put up 33 policies championed by a vice president to his name. No vice president in the fourth republic can do that. 33. He can numerate 33 policies he has championed as vice president. As he clearly put it, he has passed. So he should be promoted. Now, my brother goes on and says he's not read the book. But look, you know the man, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. If you're being asked that what is your assertion of the Ahombrasia in Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, everybody around the country has talked about his humility. Mm. Everybody about the country has talked about his hard work and his dedication to work. But you don't see, you don't see any of that. You are talking about digitization being all around the country. It just happened to grow as wheat on the ground that nobody now put it there and it grew by itself. Somebody has to initialize something. Somebody has to initiate something. So if somebody is initiating, yes, it's in other countries. As Dr. Rifley put it, if you talk about credit economy, the only sub-Saharan Africa with credit economy is South Africa. Today, he is championing and pioneering to make sure that Ghana gets a credit economy. Now, you are telling me that that just happened to fall from the sky and it will happen in Ghana regardless. But somebody is championing that. So look, for me, the book goes on to just put an icing on a cake. We all know who Dr. Mahmoud Mahmoud Baumia is. And everybody who has care to follow the life of Dr. Mahmoud Baumia knows who Dr. is. So look, we, let's not um, spend time on this. Right. The good people of Ghana mm. who have met, who have come in contact with Dr. in the last um, seven years, knows the person Dr. Mahmoud Baumia is. All right. Thank you. I'll do one last story from myjoinline.com and then we can move on to other portals. This story, I mean, it fits the occasion for today. Hatch board collapsing operations in Ghana with exorbitant fees, ex mass lock official says. Now, the story reads a former deputy chief executive officer of the Microfinance and Small Loan Center, that's Maslok, Mustafa Batalima Abubakar, has warned that the current Hajj board risks running down Hajj operations in Ghana by implementing what he describes as exorbitant charges. The charges have been seen, has seen an increase of thousands of Ghanaian pilgrims with no option but to embark on the pilgrimage through alternative routes instead of going through the Hajj board. Speaking on Joy FM Midday News, he noted that Quote, you will realize that over the last few years, we've had people trying to use the back door to embark on, on the Hajj because for them, the cost of Hajj is now expensive. Let me skip to this part where he says, he noted that during former President John Romani's time, Hajj fares were 11,900 Ghana CDs. But now the cost has risen to 75,000 Ghana CDs. For many years, there have been several complaints about Ghana's organization of the annual program, pilgrimage for Muslims. Two Ghanaian pilgrims died at this year's Hajj in Saudi Arabia. Suleiman Abraima, how does this make you feel? <laughs> well, um, first of all, condolences to um, the families who have lost lives um, or their, their relatives um, in, in Saudi Arabia um, through this Hajj. Um, it's, um, I mean, these people were on a mission to for, fulfill a religious obligation. And so... Uh, it's sad that um, this has happened. Um, on the question of pricing, I think it would be important to look at, it's, 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 it's one thing just mentioning the nominal figures, mm -hmm. maybe from 30,000 this year to now um, 70,000 that year. Um, I think that flights mm -hmm. and everything uh, are quoted in dollars. And so if, let's say, um, the dollar was, you know, five cities mm -hmm. or whatever, um, and at that time it was $1,000, uh, it means that people would have been paying 5000 Today, if the dollar is 14000 it means that people have to pay 14000 So if you look at just the nominal figures, I think that it could be misleading. Um, of course, that also means that we have to do well on our economy in terms of the stabilization of our city and strengthening of our city. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, as a worker, earning salary, um, if, I'm, if my salary is 5000 or 10000 and the dollar goes to whatever, 
my employer is not going to be able to say that I'm going to be matching your salary to the dollar. So if I plan to go to Hajj and my salary is 10,000, and um, the, the, the amount to go to dollar or the charges to go to dollar uh, to go to Hajj is um, 20,000, then I know, oh, two months of my salary can do that. If the dollar falls and by next year that I'm preparing to go, it's now going to 40,000, I'm not going to be able to tell my employer that double my salary because I want to go to Hajj. And so I, I think it all, all, all comes down to um, the management of our, of our economy. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, the Hajj board, I, I would encourage them to also look at what options could be available because I know quite a number of people who are using other means to go to Hajj and mm. it's quite cheaper. You know, people go by themselves, you know, and it's relatively um, quite cheaper. And so I think it's important that the board, the board also looks at um, what, what can be done. And then to, to just briefly say that, I'm sure if my friend Kojo um, has a company and um, the company is not doing well, the company is collapsing. I, and he has employed a CEO or a deputy CEO. I'm, I'm not sure that he's going to take explanations that, oh, we have been prioritizing processes. We've been prioritizing that. We've been prioritizing that. And the company is still going down and he will still keep those managers at post because there's evidence that they've been prioritizing the best of management and yet things are not going well. I think that is what we have to look at. I always tell people that processes matter, but what indeed matters is the results. Okay. So let's look at more of the outcomes and the results rather than, you know, processes and all of that. Because after processes, people can tell you all the things that they are doing. Everyone can tell you efforts that they are making. And uh, at the end of the day, what matters for me is results. All right. Kojo Poku, your take now. Well, um, thank you. Uh, one of the things that I was expecting my brother, who I'm sure has done the Hajj, I'm not sure if he's done it, but he can clarify for me if he's done the Hajj. Um, people who have tried to use other routes to go to the Hajj don't go and do the Hajj. And I can tell you that on authority. Yeah, Every is country correct. is given a quota. Let me land, please. Every country is given a quota. And I know this personally because I spoke to the, the, the chairman of the Hajj board on this matter because some people took a different route to Dubai and got stranded. And the, the, the communication came back that they were not being allowed to get to Mecca. Because, you know, every country, because of the stampede and all the things that has happened in the past, the Saudi authority give every country a quota. Now, you are given a visa, and these visas, you can go into Saudi Arabia, but you might not be able to go in and perform the Hajj. That's the difference. The price that the Hajj board gives is travel, accommodation, all the expenses, and the pass to go into the visa, to go into where the Hajj is performed. So a lot of people travel to Saudi Arabia, but most of them are not allowed to do the Hajj. That is the fact. Some okay. people recently, about a month or about three weeks ago, were stranded in, um, in Dubai. And uh, who, who, who did they call? The government to try and bail them out. Because some people told them, oh, it's cheaper. If you buy a ticket, you go to Dubai, this, this, this. It's cheaper than what the Hajj board is doing. And you can verify this. I'm not lying. Anybody who has access to this information can tell you that two, three weeks ago, some people were stranded in, in, in Dubai. So, yes, I, we can understand that the hardship in the country is making people find alternative routes. But the hardship in Ghana, as we've constantly explained, is the hardship around the world. It's not unique to Ghana. If you watch the international news and look at what is going on in Germany, in London, in Canada, in every country, there is extreme hardship. My auntie lives in Germany. Normally, you go to the pharmacy and go and take your medication. Today, there's a queue to take medication in Germany. So let's not play down this global phenomenon of hardship and hyperinflation that is going on, that people want to make it look like it's only particular to Ghana. It's not. You might be oblivious to the fact that no one want to admit it, but we've all seen videos of people in Canada who have gone there calling and sending videos to complain the hardships in Canada. So, right. look, I agree to the fact that people are trying to find alternative routes to go to Hajj, but not all of them, majority of them get there and they are stranded. And anybody can find out the fact. Yes, in, in the future, 
there should be and there are policies to make sure that all the economic policies that were good before COVID were good before Russia and Ukraine. We saw the president on the stage yesterday basically um, attending the, 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 the peace summit for Ukraine. Everybody is alarmed. All over 100 countries got together trying to bring peace to Ukraine. And if you all listen right. to the communique and the things that happen at the summit, everybody agrees that that Ukraine-Russia war is affecting the economy around the world. It's all making right. value chain prices go up. So please, let's not put these things down to just simple uh, politics of, oh, I've gone through West African countries and it was okay and Ghana. And, no, Kojo, it's everywhere, my brother. Your point, uh, your point is noted. But the story is about the collapse of operations because of the exorbitant fees. Now, no, it's it not says collapse. that, Today, hold, 4, on, Kojo, hold on, it's hold not, on, let head, me head. land. Okay. So the comparison is from John Mohammed's time, it was 11,000 Ghana cities. Yeah, you've spoken about hyperinflation and you know global crisis going on all over, so it's not unique to us. My question to you, yes or no, would you admit that from 11,900 CDs to 75,000 Ghana CDs, is that a reasonable jump? Would you okay. attribute when all I was that, one, would you attribute not long all that ago, to global... A portion of chips, not, on, uh, sweetie, not yeah. long ago, a portion of chips in London was 60p. Today is three pounds. The most cheapest food in London is chips. A portion of chips was 60p. Today is three pounds. So does that answer your question? So and to the point that you made, the Hajj board has not collapsed because this year they took over 4,000 people to Hajj. How has it collapsed? Collapsing. <laughs> In the no, process of collapsing. might collapse it's soon if we keep up these, it's not these collapsing. prices. They met, they met the target given to them. They were given a certain target by they were given a certain quota. They took the quota. Every year they meet their quota. Some right. people couldn't even go because the quota was full. So how is that collapsing? Let's go to graphic.com. I'll do some quick headlines here and then we can look at another um Maybe the BBC and then we'll wrap it up. Our time is, we just have about six minutes or so. Great Olympics relegated on final day of Ghana Premier League. That is a graphic online. Um, National Chief Imam praises Baumir's leadership and generosity. Elections must focus on policies, not religious differences. Mal Malawi, uh, Malawians pay tributes to Vice President killed in plane crash. Here, condolences to that. Muslims celebrate Eid al Adha today. Um, those are just some quick headlines on graphic.com. Let's go to the BBC now. There's an interesting story I saw this morning and I'll find it in a bit. Yeah, more people are turning away from news, report says. And the story reads, more people are turning away from news, describing it as depressing, relentless, and boring. A global study suggests almost four in 10, that is about 39% of people worldwide, said they sometimes or often actively avoid the news compared to 29% people in 2017, according to a report by Oxford University's Reuters Institute. Wars in Ukraine and the Middle East may have contributed to people's desire to switch off the news, the report says. It said that news avoidance is now at a record high. A total of 94,943 um, adults across 47 countries were surveyed by YouGov in January and February for this particular report. And it comes at a time where billions of people around the world have been going to the polls in national and regional elections. And I mean, we can relate here in Ghana, but let me come to you both quickly for your reactions and then we'll wrap it up. Kojo, since you're here with me, let me start with you. Is it um, right? Mm, okay. Not, not Ghana, not Nanado wrote it, not MPP wrote it, it's BBC. What did they mention in there? Russia, Ukraine. And everybody is depressed because of hardship around the world. You rightfully said it, BBC, not Ghana, not Nanado, not MPP, okay. BBC. All right. So yeah. the point I want, hold on, no, sweetie, please, let's, let's, you read it, let's digest it. The point is this, the whole world is going through a phase. There is depression all over because of hardship, because when you turn on the news, you don't hear anything uplifting. I don't think the Absolutely. whole world is going through a depression. Well, the Countries, whole world is going through a depression. I don't know what... But look, you just read a and, story and saying Musa, that and, people and are Suleiman turning away from you. And was just news. saying that most African countries are doing well. Well, we, my dear, listen, let's not go about what Suleiman said. Us, right? like, can we, read, can we go about what you read? If you want let's to not, compare how we are doing, talk of inflation... Sweetie, sweetie, 
You read BBC. Can we stick to BBC and stop? Suleiman is for BBC. The, the assertions you're making, you, no, wait, when, before not, we started you, the news review, you told you me that to I, should, I should correct some of these things on Do you want to the BBC or not? Kojo, Kojo, let me, Do you let want me, to discuss BBC or not? Let me get my point across. Before we started the news review, you said that we should be correcting some of these assertions on air. You're saying that the whole world is going through a depression, and so it's not unique to Ghana. And I'm saying that's incorrect. There are some countries okay, that are doing much better okay, than Okay, name a country. Us. Name a country that is not going through. It's not high. It's not having high inflation and it's not having economic instability. Uh, name one country. You think the United Kingdom is going through as a double double digit inflation like we are no, no, have single I, digit United inflation. Kingdom is going through you asked me to United name one country Kingdom I'm is giving going you through one, one country. of the worst economic let me land United Kingdom is going through one of the worst economic situations they've ever been through. And that is why Richie Sunak has about called for an election. I was talking about inflation, Kojo. But you know what? Let's, yes, but let's, the inflation is high. Go and check the inflation let's in the UK. Let's wrap this. Let's wrap this. Okay. But, but Let I'm me just, bring in... I just told you mm. that a 60p chips is now three pounds. When you take ten pounds to Safeway or Sainsbury's in London, you cannot buy anything. Are you saying that Paul, the economic hardship we're experiencing in this country is normal? Kojo Poku. Is that what you're Nobody trying to say? Nobody has said it's normal. You're saying my that dear. it's so what, unique what we, to us my because dear. the rest it's of the world are away. struggling like Sweetie. we are. Name Sweetie. one thing that's working in this country. people away from news normal? Sweetie, are people turning away from news normal? Name you just one thing BBC that's story. working in this country right now. Just await one thing that's working. There are people my drinking dear, dirty water talking. because they don't have access to potable water. We just spoke about cocoa, educational system. I don't know what's happening over there. Every day, we, I don't know if it's Doomso or Doomsiesie that we're talking about. You are an energy expert, and you want to say that it's Sweetie, not unique to us. Sweetie, what news did you bring up? You brought a BBC. I did it. You brought a BBC. Yes, Kojo, so let's stick to it. Yes, no, I'm don't telling you that. No, let's leave Ghana out for a minute. Listen, all right, you read give me a all second. your stories in Ghana. Kojo, Let give me, me a land, second. Please. You I'll read all your stories mm. in Ghana, went to BBC. BBC now told you that there is, a, the people are not happy, so they are turned away from news because it's depressing. And you are telling me you are coming back to Ghana. BBC did not talk about Ghana. BBC is telling you that the world is going through a depression, so people don't want to hear news. Because we are reporting on the crisis in the country. We are reporting on the deteriorating nature of our economy and everything. That's what people are turning away from. But hold on. I'll circle back to you in a bit. We've been, we've been at it for a while. Suleiman Abraima, I want to take your, bit, your thoughts before I come back to Kojo Poku. Um, thank you very much. I, I think that I would <laughs> encourage my brother Kojo to take it easy. Um, because as I said, if you are a political communicator and you are communicating on behalf of a party or a candidate, people would want to feel that you feel what they feel and you relate to their daily living experiences. And so it is important not to um, communicate as though, um, you know, people must appreciate what they are going through. The countries that Kojo is talking about in terms of depression and all of that, and I'll come to the BBC um, in, in a jiffy because I think he is doing a complete misinterpretation of what BBC is reporting. Mm. The same countries that he says, oh, they are also going through depression, the UK, Germany, um, name them. These are countries that are still providing aid to Ghana. These are countries that are still providing support to Ghana, bilateral and, you know, um, all those aid to Ghana, signing, Ghana signing other millions of grants, USAID is providing this, FCDO or DFID is providing that, you know, the German Development Corporation is providing that and so on and so forth. Are we doing the same uh, in our, in our de depressive situation? No. So please, it's not the same. Let's not be doing those comparisons. We are here. Kojo is saying UK is going through all that. Mm. Our nurses are, are moving in droves to the UK. Our, our youth are moving out. You know, I don't think that they, they go there not knowing that the situation there might be better. We're talking about what the living conditions there is. What is our daily minimum wage? In dollar terms or in pound, what is the daily minimum wage in Ghana? It is less than perhaps a pound and a half. What is the daily minimum wage in the UK? It is different. So, so we need to be, to be mindful of all these dynamics. 
when the BBC is talking about news avoidance, look, those of us who are parents, there are certain television content you will tell your kids not to watch. When, when the, and, and, and sometimes when there is, you know, something that is so bloody, even when the media outlets are going to put it out, they tell you viewer discretion is advised. Today, go to Al Jazeera, go to BBC, go to CNN. What do you see? You are looking at the devastation in the Middle East, mm. in Palestine. Kids, children who are so emaciated, children who maybe have lacked food and water for days, and you see them, and if you are somebody who is so humane, you look at it and you say, oh, why would this be happening in this world? There is in communications the cultivation theory, where it is believed that if you continue to be exposed to violence, there is a possibility that you yourself would eventually become violent. Mm. So there are theories about what people would want to watch and what people would not want to watch. So if I turn on my television and all that I see is bombings in Ukraine, soldiers who are being carried away, civilians who are being carried away, dead bodies here and there, devastation in Palestine, you know, what is happening in Rafa, what is happening in Gaza, and so on and so forth. Why do you think people would continue to want to watch those things? That is what is about news avoidance. So when they are talking about depression, they are not talking about depression in the context of economic depression or depression in the context of people suffering and therefore, um, you know, going into the health and mental status of depression. They are talking about the news content that people are being exposed to. Right. It is quite depressing, and therefore, more and more people are avoiding their screens, are avoiding their, you know, reading about these things because reading about human lives that are being lost can be quite depressing. And though, so, the best thing for me is to avoid it. And that is what they are talking about. They are not talking about it in the context of economics or living conditions and cost of living and so on and so forth. So, I think it is important that right. sometimes we we are you know, somewhere in our, in okay. our reflections and in our, in our posture. I think it's very important. All right. Um, thank you so much, Suleiman Abraima. And that's all time will allow us for. But Kojo Poko, I'll give you 30 seconds to just wrap up, please. We, we, are, we are done. We just have 30 seconds to, to go. I like it when people try to re-engineer a story. The story was read. Ukraine, Russia was mentioned. And I took my cue from that. Now, quickly, my brother said that Ghana is getting aid. Yes, we are getting aid. The UK gives aid to China. The UK gives aid to India. What is he talking about? All right. India got one all right, all right. Thank you so much. Um, um, no, no, Kojo, you know, you know this is time bound. We, me, we do me, have to go, see, gentlemen. Let me land, please. India got 1.9 billion in aid from the UK as at last year. The UK gave about 80 million dollars, uh, 80 million pounds to China in aid. What does that mean? Isn't China and India one of the richest countries in the world? What are we, we talking give, about? And we because we get aid. Aid. What does that mean? Kojo, and we give aid to who? It doesn't matter. But using your point <laughs> as in we Did you say it doesn't matter? No, you made a point. No, you, get, you made a point that because Ghana gets aid, it means what? It doesn't mean no, anything. I'm saying that the countries you are saying are going through from hardships. The, UK. the countries you are saying are going through hardships. These are the same countries that are giving us aid. You're talking about... Yeah, but they give aid. Is China going... Is China not the well, richest country in the world? Well, my guest this morning for the news review segment was um, Kojo Poku, energy expert and chairman for the Manifesto Committee on Energy for Dr. Mahmoud Baumia's campaign, and Suleiman Abraima, the executive director for Media Foundation for West Africa. Gentlemen, it was a pleasure to spend part of your morning with us. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that's how we're wrapping up for the news review segment. It's a holiday, but I don't know if you feel, it feels quite like it. <laughs> we'll be back with more on the AM show. Coming up next is sports. Stick and stay.